comes to these things. Like this. Good evening and welcome to our fourth in the series of our design forum programs, Modern Architecture Los Angeles Beyond Neutra and Schindler, which is being presented under a grant from the Graham Foundation. We have a very prestigious panel this evening and we're going to begin uh, by showing a few slides of each of the participants and giving just a, a few remarks about each one. <coughs> Uh, Tony Lumsden was to be uh, a part of the panel. He hasn't arrived yet. We're hoping he may arrive. But uh, in order not to keep you waiting any longer, we've decided to begin. We're beginning with the work of Cesar Pelle, who was born in Argentina and educated in Argentina, completing his master's work at the University of Illinois. He began working for Eero Saarinen and then came to Los Angeles. Oh, I'm sorry. I've forgotten I'm controlling the uh, slides. OK. Forgotten the routine. OK. He worked for Aero Sarnen during the years of 1954 to 64, and then came to Los Angeles uh, to work in the firm of Daniel Mann Johnson and Mendenhall. In 1968, he joined uh, Gruen Associates and has continued to work as the partner in charge of design. Our next panel member is Lou Nadorf. Uh oh. Is that Frank? Okay. No? Okay. Frank is uh, sitting to my left. We've got our slides crossed a bit. Frank was born in Romania of Austrian parentage. He grew up in St. Louis, Missouri, attending Washington University in St. Louis. He also attended the Academy of Arts in Vienna and returned to do his master's work at Washington University. He moved to Los Angeles in 65, taught at UCLA for four years, and worked with the firm of William Pereira from 69 to 74. 
At present, he is in his own practice and teaching at USC. Okay, now our next panelist is Lou Nadar. Lou was born in Los Angeles, attended the University of California at Berkeley, including his graduate work there. has been with Welton Beckett as principal and senior vice president, director of design since 1950 to the present time. Our next panelist is David Martin, born in Los Angeles, attended University of Southern California, did his master's work at Columbia. came to work as the third generation in the Albert C. Martin firm as <clears throat> associate designer. In 1974, became partner and director of design for the Albert C. Martin firm. He is also president-elect of the Southern California Chapter AIA for next year.
This is our one foot candle. It's one foot candle. Okay. Um, let's see. Okay. Our next panelist is Charles Canner, who has worked in Los Angeles since 1953. And four months ago, he joined the Charles Luckman Associates firm as Senior Vice President and Director of Planning and Design. And it is, as, um, it is the Luckman work that he is showing here tonight, and it is in that capacity that he joins the panel this evening. Chuck Canner is a second generation architect in his family. He was born in St. Louis and grew up in Los Angeles. He's a graduate of USC, worked in the office of his father, and also grew in associates. In the partnership of Mayor and Canner until 1971, in a subsequent partnership with Leroy Miller, a Canner and Miller, and then his own practice before joining the Luckman firm this year. Chuck is also a past president of the Southern California AIA, having served in 1972. And that's our panel. Anybody want to take their jackets off? Mm -hmm. Comfortable? Okay. Anyone want to take their jacket off under the hot light? Right, we're going to take jackets off. <clears throat> Please join us. Tony, did you bring slides? Did you bring slides? No? Forget it. Forget it. You all know his work, so we're glad that you could join us. topic for this evening, and we're going to try to stick to it a little bit, more than we were able to do last week, is social responsibility. And I think that um, when we look at the big firms, and all of our panelists represent uh, the firms that have done some of the most important work across the country, uh, we can't help but think that they must have stronger impact on all of our lives than some of the individual projects that smaller offices have. And um, 
I think that, that's why we thought of this as a topic, and I would, I would like to start that off as um, uh, an idea that we might discuss together in terms of attitudes um, in, in designing projects, what effect it might have on, on people's lives, what effect it might have on the city, on the urban fabric, and all of those kinds of things. So um, if, if we could, um, I hate to start with you, Tony, because uh, you just got here. Let's see, who should we start with? Lou. <laughs> Oh. I have no microphone. Oh, sorry. Wait a minute. We have to get organized here. I've been waiting 25 years for Shelley to start with me, and she does it in front of God and everybody. <laughs> <laughs> what do you want to know? You've got the mic now. Um, All right. We're supposed to talk about social responsibility, and of course, we had dinner, and uh, Caesar asked the vital question, what do we mean by social responsibility, which proves that we don't even know the meaning of the word. But uh, Shelley uh, was supposed to ask me some searching questions about Century City, so I suppose we should start with that. Uh, I'd rather talk about work that is not 20 years old, but um, first I would like to say, by the way, it's important to know uh, the work from large offices is seldom from one person. You are seeing the work from our office. It represents uh, my work in part, also the work of uh, my unfortunately talented colleagues, Robert Tyler, Marvin Taff, who is no longer with us, and uh, Carl Schwerdfeger, who is responsible for the floor project uh, at the end. Uh, with that, uh, Century City um, was an important project for us because it uh, was our first venture into city planning, and we were all a lot younger and more naive. I think more naive about uh, many of the social concerns, many of the planning issues which we would look at today. But um, I think we're satisfied with it, Shelley, because it represented what I think is important to all of us, which is that we have an opportunity to give the best that we have at a point in time. I don't think that we can uh, look to give uh, what we might 20 years ahead of time, or what we might give under some idealized circumstances. But that uh, the large office gives us a climate within which we can work to our limits. The flaws of Century City, um, I'm content because they represent my flaws. Um, flaws of youth or naivete or whatever. It also represents, I think, um, some reasonable concerns and some things that were successful. The um, a debate at that time, and you have to go back 20 years, when the interest was, would downtown Los Angeles ever become anything? We had a 13-story height limit then. And the fine work of uh, David Martin's office was not there. The, um, or would the city merely spread out into the suburbs? Our office put forward the notion that uh, a city did not have to take solely the traditional form of the eastern cities. It did not have to have solely a downtown, but it could not really exist without one. And our notion was that both the downtown area and other urban areas within the city had a place, primarily to give a spectrum of choice to businessmen, just as one hopes that a city gives choice to people in where they live. And we debated honestly amongst ourselves what kind of attitude we should take toward a urban area which was neither downtown nor suburban. And it, it's only partially successful. We struggled with uh, English concepts of townscape and things which seem very remote today. But there, in going through there, I can tell you that there was an honest concern for the response of people to the space. You might wonder why the pedestrians and automobiles were not separated. I've been asked that. They are separated in the important sense that you don't have to get hit by a car to cross the street. They were deliberately kept part of each other's visual field because we realized that the concentration of people would be low, low for an urban area. 
and that in Los Angeles the automobile was an important part of the dynamic of the city, visually. And so we kept them horizontally at the same plane and separated them carrying people over and under the streets. Many notions like that. But Caesar and others here will tell you later that the architect has just a small part of the work. Developers, city planners, many who come before and after us have a major role. And the office, we represent the big offices. But we're peanuts. Uh, we have 120 people or 130 in Los Angeles, and you have about the same. And I think up and down the line, you have these vast General Motors of 120 people. <laughs> My god, you've got our whole combined offices here this evening. Uh, and so we don't have uh, perhaps a sort of enormous social or political clout that one might imagine. We have uh, more responsibility than some of the offices because we're gifted in the sense that we're privileged, I should say, by having larger and in, in that sense uh, important work in its impact on the people. And I think uh, what can be asked of us is that uh, we give our best, we negotiate a hard fee, and then forget about it. Um, as representing a, a firm that, that has been working since the days when the, the city hall was planned as a, a joint project, and uh, through all of the work that's, that's, the good work that's been done by the margin firm downtown, um, I would be very, very interested to know about your attitudes about the impact of those projects and, and uh, the feelings that you have in planning them. That's not what, not what I was going to talk about. <laughs> okay. let's, see, let's see if I can answer the question. It seems to me that uh, in, in thinking over the uh, topic for the discussion tonight that, uh, that all architects have uh, a social responsibility. Uh, uh, and, and, and that responsibility is getting greater and greater as our society gets more and more complex. <coughs> I feel that that responsibility is to really direct the client, uh, to uh, show the client alternatives that have better benefits to our communities and better f benefits to our, our societies. Uh, architects themselves uh, uh, cannot uh, impact a, uh, cannot affect a social change. They, they really affect a, a change for the better through the, their work and through the clients. Architects only provide uh, a, a service, a service to clients who build the, the, the built environment. But I think that they do have, a, have a, a real responsibility to educate themselves and to educate their clients to proper choices. Uh, we have a responsibility to show clients, uh, uh, for example, in a very quantifiable way, uh, how much energy their building is going to use. That's an easy subject to talk about because we can design a building one way and, and, and you can say it uses so many barrels of oil a year, and you can design it another way, and it uses a lot less. It's a definite, quantifiable response to improve our community. There are a lot of other um, uh, things that we can do, a lot of other directions that we can point, to, uh, uh, point out to our client. We have to keep informed in this rapidly changing world of, uh, of issues ourselves, and then we have to educate our clients. Um, I'd like to say it's becoming more and more like the educational process in the universities, uh, and, and there might be a real corollary there. We find ourselves writing papers on, on seismic design and presenting papers to engineering societies and writing papers on, on what we have found out about energy conservation and that was what some of those slides were, and, and, and sharing, sharing that information with our professionals. Uh, uh, we find that we have to go to school. We have to keep up with all the technology. And then we have to pass that on and give our clients the, the choices. Um, how, how that fits into to downtown, uh, uh, maybe, uh, I, I don't know how to relate that very well. I, I'm, we're, most noted for our, our 
urban projects. So we're really kind of urban, urban architects, our firm is. And I see such a delightful thing happening to the cities of America that I, I'm really, really behind, uh, uh, really proud and really happy to see what is happening to cities like Minneapolis and cities like Atlanta uh, and, and what's starting to happen in downtown Los Angeles, which I think maybe most of our firms are participating in some of the activities downtown Los Angeles. Where, we, where instead of walking down the street next to a bunch of automobiles, you walk down the street next to a Calder sculpture and the street goes underneath a waterfall and you go through a garden and you go through uh, uh, landscape parks from, from housing to cultural centers to offices. We're just beginning to create a new kind of a downtown that's, that is a definite positive response to our community. That, town, that downtown and all those high rises, that, that's not really for everybody. There's a lot of people that hate that. A lot of people that would rather be out in the suburbs. They would rather be out in a soft, quiet kind of a life. But they have that choice. There's a lot of people that demand the high culture and the, and the, and the high uh, art, music, uh, the trade, the business, the excitement that downtowns have. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's, it's like, Hayakawa said the other day to the AIA, he says, I'm for the preservation of urban life, and that, that means a lot to me. I, I think that we have that kind of a choice. There's the other choice, too, of the suburban people and the people who want the country, return to nature and so on, and that's also a very viable part of our, our society, and, and that's another kind of a response that we have. I hope that we never have one trying to pull down the other, one in favor of the other. I hope we can always have both. But, but to me, the, the, the social responsibilities that all architects have is really an educational one. It's a matter of staying on top of the whole technology, the whole change that's going on right now. It's what's going on right now, and how does what the client is doing, how does that affect the community? Thank you, David. Chuck, would you like to pick? You've got your own mic. You should be able to. Is it working? Can you hear me back there? Okay, you can hear me. I'm in a unique position, having come from a small practice, dealing with clients who, uh, in many respects, were interested only in how, many, how much square footage can I enclose for the least amount of dollars, to a uh, a large corporate practice dealing with corporate clients who are very sophisticated. And in terms of uh, social responsibility, um, it's a lot more interesting to deal with these guys who really are concerned with what their image is going to be. Our projects are extremely visible. and. Uh, we take the social responsibility for that very seriously. Um, we have put some interesting buildings in downtown. Broadway Plaza uh, has turned out to be a people place. Uh, there's sunshine coming through the skylights, and people gravitate to that. Uh, we're involved right now in the site selection project for, uh, we've been retained by the city to do the site selection for the new central library. And uh, there is a tremendous amount of social impact involved in where that building is going to be placed in the central city. Uh, in, in general terms of social responsibility, there are some aspects of design that are beyond the architect's ability to control. And the, uh, the ability of the large office, if they really were interested, uh, to uh, use their political clout uh, is there. Housing. It's, here we have a, 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 a tremendous need for housing on one hand. Uh, we have a construction industry today that has been relatively inefficient for the last several years, uh, just waiting to get busy. We have a need on one hand, we have the ability to put it together on the other, and then for, for some strange reason we can't make that gel. Uh, that is not the architect's problem solely, except to be aware of it and to be able to uh, point out the problems. 
certainly energy conservation is a, a, a subject that uh, they've touched on. Part of that problem is, again, not the architect's problem. We have a rate structure which encourages waste. The, the uh, greater quantity of utilities that a building uses, the lower the unit cost rate. It's ridiculous. It should be turned around. Uh, provide incentives for a developer to say to the architect, look, man, every kilowatt that that building uses is going to cost me. So, uh, and, and that could have a very marked effect on architectural design. Um, and we're aware of those kinds of problems, and I think you will find that the large office, um, if they weren't just so darn busy trying to uh, scrounge up work, could take some time to get behind some of these other issues, and I think you'll find that they do. And uh, I see that as an approach to social responsibilities that large firms could do, shall I? I need to say, I need to make a couple of corrections, and then I'd like to get on what uh, perhaps another point of view of the subject is tonight. I have to tell you that, of course, other people were involved uh, in these projects, or some of them, just like in any other large office, when I was at William Pereira Associates, which I'm not anymore. And uh, I must say, and, uh, and a couple of guys are here, like Eric Moss and uh, Bob Caddis and so on. So, so much for equity. The, the, uh, the, the other thing which I, I must uh, offer you as a, as a counterpoint is that I left a large office not because I felt that I was taxed to my definition of my capabilities, professional capabilities, but because uh, quite the opposite, that uh, I found myself and some very select few uh, friends working uh, in a very uh, hostile environment and uh, under extreme duress. And it's uh, because of that that uh, I think uh, Perhaps this is uh, unique uh, to a particular office. But I find the architects doing precisely some of the things that uh, uh, I would assume some people think is adequate. That is, that they did not take a, what I would consider a leadership or responsible role, that they were extensions of the so-called client's uh, interests, which uh, may uh, not always have been uh, responsible interests. and. Uh, that uh, the kind of cooperation and uh, uh, professional ideals to be pursued between the, the firms was equally, I think, uh, lacking or not existing at all. So uh, if social responsibility means that if you do visible projects because they are tall, or if you do visible projects because uh, they enclose a lot of space, or because you do a million dollars uh, annual amount of work in comparison to the uh, small offices. I think that's one subject matter. And then I think probably it's uh, a different discussion, the large offices versus the medium and small size offices. We couldn't establish, uh, you know, if who does more volume, the large offices uh, in this area or all of the small offices combined. But I, I, I do think I get competition here. I, I, I do think that uh, some of the uh, uh, reasons why large offices are the center of or the focus of some criticism for lack of social responsibility or for exploiting uh, uh, some, uh, let's say, real estate interests is because their projects are more visible than small offices, and it is because they often, or more often than not, build for a very uncertain condition in terms of user and in terms of time scale. And I do think that, uh, to, to uh, go back to the Century City example, I do think that architects or urban designers do have to have a responsibility span that is longer than 20 years because it's uh, a moment in, in uh, any historic context. And I think it's not done as much as it ought to be done. I think the kind of leadership or research activity or development of prototypical solutions to, um, let's say, common problems, if you take housing or if you take schools or if you take uh, 
other categories of uh, building prototypes which could be pursued by large offices because they, they do have the political cloud, as you said, or the economic stability to do so is, uh, again, an area which I think is uh, certainly neglected or uh, enjoys limited uh, attention. So all in all, I think if, if we accept architecture, as, as we try to say, as a conservative activity because it has to be supported by the powerful, either politically powerful or economic powerful, you always will have a gap between uh, the needs of the few, if only a few are powerful, and the needs of uh, um, perhaps uh, the majority. And that is, a, I think, a, a gap that existed for some time. And I think it's a, a gap that, if you like, architecture, including us, hasn't managed to bridge. And I, I think the, the opportunity to make an attempt, perhaps, would lie with larger offices because of reasons just stated and uh, would be more difficult for small offices. But let me just say in conclusion so that we can get on with this, uh, that uh, it is equally, I think, not adequate to assume that because an office is small and because it does single family or customized residential or customized uh, commercial, that they are, have more social responsibility because, you know, they subdivide the closet properly to the man's clothes which uh, is, I think, a, a popular misconception. So. Thank you, Frank. Caesar, would you... Uh, would I what? Favor us with uh, some attitudes of, of, about this sure. subject? Uh, I cannot help but think, though, that the primary responsibility of an architect is to do good architecture. Um, I really, if an architect tells me that he contributes to the United Fund and you know has marched in parades and have picketed builders that were going to demolish some good buildings, but his architecture is bad, that I will respect him for being responsible. His really <coughs> essential responsibility is towards the responsibility that he has been entrusted with society. An architect is entrusted with very large social resources, and he has to give them form. And, uh, and this can be measured at many different levels. One is the basic responsibility towards his immediate clients or users. The other one is a larger responsibility towards the social context at large, people that are going to see that building, use that building, enjoy it where the building may affect silhouettes, landscape, um, movement patterns, etc. There is also a still larger responsibility within a, a historical context in the sense that that building will remain there for many years after the people who are enjoying or hating it will have ceased to enjoy, hate it, or have moved away to some other city. Uh, and there is still uh, our basic and most important one, to me the key one, is that whenever an architect is given a problem, it's his basic responsibility to transcend that problem. That just solving a problem adequately is not enough. Uh, the, and there is, of course, where it becomes very difficult. Uh, there is, a, I think, he's given a certain authority, a certain amount of control, very limited, extremely limited in most cases. And usually, the larger the project, the less control the architect is given. Uh, the smaller the project, the more control the architect is given. So those things work actually in almost direct inverse proportion to the, to the magnitude of the project. Uh, the, and he has, I think, the responsibility to make something more than resolving all of the questions that the problem raises. And this may be aesthetical, social, philosophical, uh, symbolic, whatever. Different times in our society, different historical times would require different things. Uh, and whatever was sufficient or important 50 years ago is not sufficient or important today. And probably whatever we value very dearly will be of secondary importance only 
even 20 years from now when many of you will be practicing. Uh, I see many students here or young architects, and by the time you are in the full bloom of your practice, many of our concerns will have ceased to be relevant. And this may be concerns of all sorts, the things that we may consider most important today, socially important or uh, existentially important, may cease to have any value. So we have to deal with those problems as they come every time. Uh, the, as far as what the practices do and how large they are, there is not a basic substantial difference between what we call a large practice or a small practice. I think all practices of architecture are small. I, will, I agree completely with what Lou was saying earlier. <coughs> The, the largest of practices, which is probably in terms of pure architectural practice, must be Skidmore, Owens, and Merrow. It's only a few times larger than a very small practice. Uh, if, a, if a small practicing architect with a couple of persons or three persons helping him is an ant in this economic fauna, uh, a large architectural practice like SOM is not larger than a beetle. Uh, you know, and there are elephants and trotting around uh, in this landscape. So that the amount of cloud that architects have is insignificant. Usually the cloud is reduced to the influence that some individuals, architects have, in having some very powerful friends or acquaintances that they have been made as clients or serving in committees, etc. You know, and one of the most influential architects I know, for example, it's a Nat Owens of Skidmore, Owens, and Merrow, because of his personal uh, contacts. But this is a personal influence. And it's not because he has any political or economic clout himself. Um, the, the architect is, a, is basically a servant to society. And as such, he functions. And as a servant, he may be a very influential servant. But he's always a servant to society. Uh, if he has. If he has wealth, it's because the wealth is inherited and he can use it to whatever purpose, just like if he was not an architect like somebody like Philip Johnson. And within the firm, the responsibilities are not primarily the firm's responsibility. They are really individual responsibilities. What really counts are the responsibilities of some individuals within the firm, and not everybody. The responsibilities vary with the levels of authority that the, each firm has established within the, in, in order to work and to, and to apportion responsibilities, in, internal responsibilities. Uh, I have very definite responsibilities. I have authorities that come with it, and therefore the privileges of some authority. But I, I therefore, I bear responsibilities. And of the project I have shown, the responsibility for their design is mine, if they are good, I will be very happy and I will take the primary bow. But if they are bad, I will also uh, take all of the rotten tomatoes with it, because it is my responsibility. It is not so much the firm. The, 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 the firm's responsibilities end within some very specific individuals. If two or three individuals are changed in a firm, the attitudes of the firm will change. Uh, they sh those, those responsibilities, they are important, should not disappear in a, in a corporate facade, uh, sh because they are always some, some bodies. Uh, and, uh, and if, if the, the Gruen firm, with which I have been working, has done certain very good things in the past, I may be pleased to be associated with them, uh, or not, for some things that may may disagree with. But they have also been some bodies' responsibility. They don't become mine by, have, by, by I having joined the firm, although I may show some level of compatibility by having accepted uh, joined the firm. I, I, I'll stop here. Thank you, Cesar. Tony, are you ready to join us? Yeah, I'll, yeah, I'll have a crack at it. Uh, I, I think I'll talk about a different aspect of uh, of uh, social responsibility or, or large office responsibility. I'm, I'm interested in design, but I'm also interested in uh, the rules of the game. And I'm very interested in quantities. I think, in fact, in nature, 
and certainly in cities, the effect of quantities is far superior to the effect of architectural intentions or, or aesthetics. And uh, I mean, our city environment really more has to do with uh, how much real estate or how much square footage can you build in particular areas rather than whether an architect designs it in a specific way or not. It's probably the, uh, it's up to each individual or society as a whole to affect real estate values or regulations or tax, uh, tax effects or, uh, or, uh, or so, uh, certain developments that are not, uh, not paying their own way to, uh, to uh, respond to uh, the interests of society as a whole. And I'm really not very, uh, I'm not really satisfied with the notion of high density where uh, you get an individual living 50 miles from the center of town and traveling uh, 50 miles to and fro and uh, supposedly associating with uh, the life of the city. That's, well, that's one aspect of, of quantity. I mean, whether, whether the World Trade Center is good looking or bad looking, its influence in terms of quantities is, uh, is very important. And, uh, and uh, uh, I'm not sure whether, whether that would, one would assess that that's done by a large office or a small office. The, the, uh, the things in, in a large office that may be a little different uh, to a small office uh, have in part to do with the way a fee is used. And I think firstly I'd like to discuss a little of the, the total architectural arch attitude about fee. I mentioned it to David Martin the other night. But uh, the situation relative to students is that uh, students are not paid enough. And I think in a lot of cases, really, architects are not paid enough. And perhaps if a student is going to be paid or a young graduate is going to be paid uh, five bucks an hour, seven bucks an hour, whatever it is. But in fact, uh, that, the, the client is charged something like $22 an hour for that time. The, the, uh, that's one aspect of, uh, of uh, using a fee. The other aspect is that the amount of money that a, that a firm, any firm, spends on design relative to the total fee is quite small. As far as I'm concerned, the whole structure of, uh, of division of fee in the AIA contracts is bad. And then maybe the fee is consumed a little larger, a little faster in large offices, and I believe it is. And the difference mainly is that in a small office, especially on small jobs, the individual architect can put more of his time than he's paid for. It's uh, okay, maybe he should have budgeted himself uh, 20 hours or 1,000 hours, but in fact he may work on it until he's satisfied, which may be 2,000 hours. In general, in a large office, that's not possible. With respect to, uh, with respect to the division of fee of any architect, you get this, uh, the, the, uh, the schematic phase, which is 15%, the uh, preliminary phase, which may be 35%, construction documents and supervision. In fact, most of, the, most of the social decisions, most of the aesthetic decisions, most of the functional decisions, most of the cost productive decisions are made in the schematic phase. Now, the schematic phase includes uh, program elements, uh, uh, liaison with clients, uh, the, uh, the documentation of decisions and a small percentage, maybe 3%, 4% or whatever, spent on actual design. Now, if, if most of the decisions in design occur in that phase and only that percentage of the fee of the schematic phase is, uh, is uh, used of that phase, I think the architects are really representing or misrepresenting the, the quality of their efforts uh, compared with uh, a construction firm or a, uh, a working drawing firm or whatever uh, uh, to the client. I don't think many architectural firms would be willing to say when they, when they propose their expertise that we're going to spend 5% uh, uh, of your fee, which is 5% or 6% of the construction amount on design. The rest we're going to spend on construction documents, uh, job supervision, which really has to do with protection of their own interests as with relative to errors and omission. Preliminary phases, doing some niceties that really have nothing to do with social value 
and, uh, and the uh, general environment of the building, and it's really more aesthetics and organization and, uh, and, uh, and uh, detailing. And one of the other aspects about a large office is that they do, I think any, any office that's going to do, well, or anybody who's going to do a large uh, building probably requires a certain number of people. And uh, the large building is really a different uh, kind of, jo of job. Obviously, its effect on the environment is different, but it's a different kind of job to a small building. I mean, there's a major distinction between house architecture and, uh, and, uh, and uh, commercial construction. Commercial construction involves mechanical engineering, structural engineering, I mean, structure and engineering, etc., and division of fee in a certain way, but it also includes building elements that, uh, that relate to construction price that is not as flexible as, uh, as two by four structure in a house. I mean, in, if you get a 20 buck a square foot building, it may be that uh, if, if seven dollars a square foot is allocated to structure and four bucks a square foot is allocated to, engine, to uh, heating and ventilating, that they are in fact, uh, uh, they have no effect on the environment of the building. I mean, in terms, uh, then they are not flexibly uh, related to design. One may approach it on the basis of this is a way we can use that amount of money and that amount of money is going to be consumed uh, if we make minimal decisions. Now in a house that's really quite different. You can take your 20 bucks or 40 bucks or 50 bucks and move it all over the place. And a lot of that is at the architect's, uh, at the architect's will. In a, in a, in a large co co commercial structure, especially one close to budget, that's not possible. If you get $100 a square foot, and the minimal decisions with respect to structure can be solved in, uh, and all of the engineering to solve can be solved for twenty dollars. Then you might uh, spend sixty bucks or whatever on finishings and materials and spaces that are architect at the architect's discretion. But in general, that's not the case in a large commercial structure. Going back to the point about uh, about fee, I think it's true in some of the buildings we do, and I'm sure it's true in some of the buildings that some of the others do, that. Uh, and, uh, well, the, the office building we occupy, uh, it won a, a minor award in the, in the latest AIA uh, jury. And, but uh, I think we spent about 10 cents a square foot on design. Now, if you relate that, if you relate that to, uh, to the, the cost saving that maybe occur, occur in the design time, I mean, if we're wise, we might save the client anywhere from five bucks, 10 bucks, 15 bucks in construction cost. If, if we're efficient in delivery of the building, we might say saving 1% a month of construction costs. But uh, the amount of money that the AIA is, is allocating to design through their fee structure and the amount of money that the architects are spending in design, I think is probably crucial to, uh, to uh, the effect of uh, the, the real, the real uh, change in, or the potential change in, uh, in uh, uh, the, the quality of design that architects in general can deliver. And again, you have to remember that they really apply to everything other than a house. Yes, thank you. Um, for the first time, maybe the question of cost has been raised. And it's a critical one because it's really said is that we have limited resources both in fee and in dollars. And we're, ch we're asked to do the best we can within that. I think uh, this is the first panel where we've not had a, pre you know, a review of the previous panel's uh, comments. And I think uh, one question you might have vis-a-vis -vis cost or social responsibility or anything else is whether any of the projects you see up here, do they represent the same kind of technology that you see in today's housing? Or what do they represent? Bernard Zimmerman is standing over there. I'm scared to death he's going to present a white paper, so I'm trying to sneak this in quickly. Um, he, last week, the panel raised the question, um, you know, they're, they're split on, in two camps. One camp, represented by Bernard, said that we ought to move toward a, a you know, the use, intensive use of technology in our buildings. Uh, the other opted for a more romantic and humane kind of approach uh, 
actually neither, there were not really two camps uh, because Bernard is nothing if not humane and the others of course want to use uh, technology. But I think if we want to talk about large offices, one thing that might interest you is that all the bloody projects that you see up here are not stuck together with two by four and nails. They represent a very high level of technology. In fact, probably the highest sensible one, which is measured in part by whether or not it's economically feasible. Now there's an incredible amount of bullshit about technology. And uh, what we usually mean, and what students usually mean, and a hell of a lot of architects mean, is that it looks technological, which means it looks bolted together, has an absolute minimum number of repetitive parts, and so on. And what is truly technological is usually pretty svelte um, and has an incredible variety to it. These buildings, true, are not trucked to the site. I don't think. Um, it, it, I, I, grant me that that's not too, too reasonable an assumption, except that they really were. They were trucked to the site in parts. Uh, these buildings are not made out of lath and plaster. They're made out. They're systems buildings, by and large, and they represent the efforts of a pretty sophisticated technological industry. It's not necessary for architects to invent the technology. We have to light a fire under the ass of the people who do and ask for it, and by and large, they produce. Not always, and there are lags, and there are uh, union restrictions, and there are all the other things that, that nag at you. But to hold costs, I think you might be interested. Uh, our fees have plummeted, uh, mainly because uh, their architect's fees are largely based on uh, some sort of percentage of construction cost. And construction cost has not gone up, or building cost has not gone up nearly as sharply as other costs have. Why? Because of the advent of systems approaches to all of these office buildings, whether it's curtain walls, internal dry partition systems, structural systems, uh, mechanical systems. We get involved in hospitals now, and they're truly systems. Not all Margot, I know. Um, so the architect in our large offices, I think, one asset they have is the resources to tie to a degree at least into technology. Now I, I think the question really is whether these buildings are, the buildings themselves are socially desirable. That's another question. If I do a hospital, I really feel good. No question about that to my mind. Um, I don't feel as good if I do a high-rise office building and it's going to be filled with suede shoe attorneys no, we're safe. Uh, you know, flogging products on people. But that's the other aspect of the architect's work. At least you, then I think you get your mind off of some of those people and you think of all the other thousands of users in the building. Another thing, rattling on. Um, instead of all the words, we do have an asset. Uh, we don't have to talk in words. We use powerful visual images to speak to people. And that's a responsibility we have. Um, I saw Oscar Farmer here this evening. He represents, and all of us on this platform represent another aspect of the larger office. You might consider, especially the students, not everybody has the guts, balls, entrepreneurship, business sense, family wealth, whatever it takes to go out and found a major firm. So if nothing else, the large firms give fine talents, as Oscar, who did Broadway Plaza, entree to projects. They may bedevil you and frustrate you, and um, you know we've all experienced that. But um, they do give you entree to them, and once in a while you can break through, and you can do something rather fine. And speaking solely for myself, I didn't have the balls to go into private practice, so it's a chance to get entree to work, to design, to serve as a designer on projects. Any other comments about the opportunity for uh, a designer in, in the big office? Any other feelings about that that any of you would like to, uh, to speak to? 
probably to be better if there were questions. We may be talking mm. about something that nobody's interested in. <laughs> well, <clears throat> you've got more questions. Yeah. <laughs> I just thought I'd pick Good. up on that. Um, I, I would like to know how, how far you feel you can go to affect social change in your work. Anybody? Would you like to take it? Not particularly. No? <laughs> I, I let, let, let me change it around a little bit. And I'd like to ask the other people here um, on the panel, w one of the things that I think is fascinating is that the kinds of projects that we get involved in because of uh, the, the teams of people we assemble in our firms. Uh, we get involved in, in, in certain kinds of projects that uh, a one and two man firm can't really do very well uh, or, or is not organized to do. I think that's a better way to put it. Um, f f for example, and I, and I hope other people can mention examples, the, the, one of the projects that was in the, the Martin set of slides was, it was probably the poorest slide, but uh, it, it was a very well-designed plant that changes household garbage into crude oil. And if there's anything in the world that society needs right now, it's something like that. Uh, you get rid of the garbage and you get oil. And uh, that's a phenomenal way to participate in something that helps society. Um, uh, a couple of other uh, examples that, that we've worked on are factories. We've done a lot of factories, and, and, and to, to try to deal with the problems of a factory and an assembly environment and the, the economies of that and, and the architectural challenge and the rewards that you get after you finish a project and people like to work in a certain place. And, you, and when you do the job right and, and you manage to satisfy some of the the more basic needs of people who are working in factory environments. Um, uh, I think that's, that's probably a, a couple of examples, but I, I know that, uh, um, oh, you know, implications in what David has said. By saying that if one works on a plant that transforms garbage into oil or in a hospital, these are good things, the implication, therefore, is that there are other projects that are not good. The truth is, that whenever a building is built, in some form, this is being built for society. Society is all of us acting independently or collectively. And if we need a place to shop and a place to shop is built, that is helping society. The same thing is true if we build buildings for lawyers to be in. Those lawyers working I'm not, I don't see why a lawyer working, although I may not disagree, I agree completely with what the lawyers do, but if a lawyer working is not a worse person than the same lawyer sick in a hospital, suddenly, you know, we feel that it is, <laughs> it's exactly the same person. And it may be more important that he has a good environment to work in day after day than particularly good environment to be three days whenever he's sick. It's the same person. It's the same person that goes shopping. It's the same person that goes to a movie, that goes to a theater, that takes a hotel when he's in vacation. Whatever we built is built for society. And I do, the, 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 I do believe that the changes that an architect can create or change society are only if the architect understands what the social forces are and can guide them. I don't believe an architect can change those social forces. He is not in a position where he can do so. It's much too late by the time it comes to an architect. By the time the things, the, where an architect can be most positive is in guiding those forces. It means that he can shift those forces by half of one degree. If enough of those half of one degrees, of course, accumulate, you know, the whole thing may turn 180 degrees, but whenever through architecture more radical changes have been attempted, have proved disastrous because the, the buildings are not the places where social forces can be changed. The buildings represent very large social investments. And only, you know, if, the, if, the, if all of the elements that, by these people that are responsible for creating these forces or for dedicating those resources, there is a full cooperation between users, 
investors, whatever it may be, the state, capital, foundations, and the architect guides them, something can be achieved. That's good. That, that um, fits in with the next idea about how do you feel about affecting the, the uh, quality of change, uh, affecting uh, the quality of, of living of the people who uh, use the projects that you design? Are there projects that give you uh, special pleasure for having affected the quality of life for the users? Would you speak to that? Um, all of you. Chuck? Sure. I don't see how you can really differentiate between one kind of a project and another. A building is a building to be used. And uh, if it's an office building for lawyers or a hospital or a factory, you have a responsibility as a designer to do a good job and create a, a, an environment where that person who uses the building can use it and enjoy it. And uh, I, I just don't see how you can separate it out. Well, it seems to be certain projects, um, like um, your, the uh, Courthouse Commons, perhaps, which is a, a recent project that is used by people. Yes, yes, this is That's particularly pleasurable to me. Uh, Shell is referring to the commons in Columbus. The very rarely, as an, as an architect, I am entrusted with the responsibility for determining function. Usually, uh, social bodies, represented in very different manners or come in different guises, determine what the functions require, required functions are and where the monies are going to be invested. Uh, but, and there with that you do the best you can. In this particular project, I had a very enlightened client, uh, Erwin Miller in Columbus, and I was just very lucky to get that commission, uh, where I was entrusted with the whole uh, responsibility of creating the functions to perform a certain very important vital need, which was to bring activity back into the core of, the, of a city. Therefore, that was very rewarding, uh, much more rewarding than doing buildings into which the, the human values are quite minimum, like if one does indeed an office building where all one does is package space where people are going to be packaged inside. Uh, that is response to a social need, but the human values are very minimum. Uh, in this particular case, the, you know, all that we were interested was in everything that we may call a, a socially important or where the human values are preeminent. But it is not of my choice. I was just very lucky to have that commission. And therefore, I enjoyed it enormously, and it becomes much more important to me. And it's, from that point of view, it is the most important job I have done. Um, the same thing, you know, when uh, Tony and I did a housing project in Hawaii, uh, the, we were entrusted with something that was already addressing itself to improve in certain conditions that we held dear. Uh, not because it's particularly more important to society, but it because it's closer to some of our own ideals. But we were very lucky to get that project, you know, and I have tried since then many times to get other housing projects and never could. Um, so I haven't worked in any other housing projects. Yes, Frank. I really uh, feel like we're part of the Chamber of Commerce. And, and uh, I, I think uh, Bernard, any, <laughs> anybody that wears a three-piece suit, Bernard, is suspect. <laughs> but, <clears throat> but I think uh, I'd like to get back to a couple of issues which uh, which perhaps are interesting to pick up. You know, this, uh, it seems that large offices seem to get larger opportunities in, you know, or in project sizes, and therefore could uh, as, at least uh, in notice uh, invisibility affect uh, an urban fabric or landscape more decisively than small firms. And I think uh, perhaps uh, the, the large offices, the, the ones I know, and I. I don't know all of them, but it isn't all as swell as it appears. I think, in part, uh, the level of effort spent on design is uh, the result of uh, society's uh, value that they put on the contribution of the designer. You know, I mean, the lawyers get a higher fee, perhaps, because there's an easier quantifiable benefit from good legal advice. 
Well, uh, it's perhaps not as easy to demonstrate what the benefit is of uh, good architecture, if, even if there were agreement of what, defini what, what that definition is. I do think that we could agree what Caesar says, that everybody ought to try to do good architecture. The problem is, I think, that uh, architects in general, in particular, those that uh, have the uh, support or the foundation of large organizations, uh, should take more of an advocacy role and should not be, uh, I would say, complacent or satisfied with uh, being a, a servant. Because I think uh, even in the category of servants, there are enlightened servants that rule a house and those that are tolerated in the house. And, and uh, I think architects uh, have much uh, too important a contribution to make than in the social service, if you like, to perform, which uh, I think is not coming forward as clearly as it could. Now that uh, you know, holds true in hospitals. There are terrible hospitals, regardless who occupies them. They're terrible office buildings. You know, there are equally terrible schools, but uh, very few architects propose, uh, let's say, perhaps more expensive or marginally viable alternatives, unless somebody, which is called client, comes around and asks them to do so according to his definition of the problem and according to his or the client's parameters of viability. Now, I, I, I would like to suggest that this is not the, happy, the happiest per, uh, uh, position for the profession or uh, an architect to find himself in. You, you meant, yes, you want to say something? Yes. All right. It's a poor servant indeed that has to get a microphone. No, I think one important thing to talk about is there is a major difference between the large office and the small one. Um, a one-man office, no, more than that. A one-man office you can think of as at least monolithic by definition, or three man, a three-man office, a principal and a couple other people. Uh, there is uh, certainly a unanimity of the goals and objectives. There's one man who owns the thing and he drives it and it goes where he wants it to go for good, bad, or, or, or whatever. Uh, it's not proper to really think of the large firms in the same sense because they're, they're not some monolithic structure. Um, we represent, uh, first of all, offices that superficially look alike and the work uh, may look relatively similar. They're structured quite differently. They were founded for different motives. Uh, their attitudes are different. Uh, sometimes they go, uh, they go with you. Sometimes you must struggle against them. I'll only speak for my office, and David and others can speak for theirs. Um, I wouldn't pretend that our office has any desire, I wish it were otherwise, uh, for some altruistic social benefit. I think the management of our office sees its role as a rather traditional one of providing a, you know, an architectural service, uh, receiving a fee, staying in business, maintaining itself as solvent. Um, it, I think it perceives itself in a very traditional way. Um, it does not see a role as an advocate. I don't put it down for that. Uh, but I feel it incumbent then upon certain of us within the firm to try and take a different viewpoint. And the struggle goes on. Sometimes we win, sometimes we lose. Uh, design, as, as you may not yet realize, is not one of the, you know, the children of joy in large offices. It's a pain in the ass to them uh, to get uh, to fight and struggle for a little bigger share of the pie with the mechanical and structural and electrical engineers is one of the, you know, the interesting aspects of, of design. Uh, to get 11% uh, instead of 10% uh, or whatever. So it is not as if there is one feeling or one action in a firm. Their firms are being driven in different directions. And they're driven also by economic climate and time. As, as a given firm sees itself shrinking in size, and s the only books that come in have only chapter 11 in them, and you're s slipping over the edge into bankruptcy, the, at the management level in the firm, 
there's a certain disenchantment with designers wanting to throw out the design and start all over again. But, but you might ask yourself, there's some pretty goddamn decent buildings up here. I wonder where they came from out of this non-altruistic, business-oriented, traditionally climated, corporate soup of all of these goddamn big, mo you know, monsters up here. Uh, the reason is that uh, they're not venal. Um, they're uninformed, perhaps. And most of us try and struggle as best we can against it. Now, admittedly, the work you see here, the most creative thing, perhaps, in some of the work you see here is the time that went into finding the slides and discarding some of the others, you know, <laughs> that you don't really want to show. But, uh, you know, and, and uh, we all have those streets you don't want to drive down. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but, uh, even you, Caesar? I got wear in Argentina someplace. No. I, I must tell you, I was it's, it, for years. I've been operating under the you know assumption that Caesar was Italian, and so I just liked his work because I like Italian things. Now he's Argentinian. <laughs> Sorry to disappoint you. Yes, it's all right. You, you think like an Italian at least, but. Uh, <laughs> At any rate, we, we really should give, you know, uh, Bernard has been sitting over there and he wants, he wants to do something vital, I think, to all of us, so we should give him a chance to. Tony, did you have anything special that you wanted to... Uh... <laughs> Bernard had his chance last week, right? Uh, Wait. I, I, I have a point in general, I think, uh, that's important to me, and uh, it's, I think it's a lack that it generally occurs in... In, uh, in the profession and maybe, uh, maybe identified in large offices more than it is in small offices. But, uh, and I think all of us know doing buildings is fairly difficult, but uh, there's still probably a uh, too limited an understanding of uh, what design is about in architecture. And I'd just one tagline I'd, uh, I'd uh, like to submit is, uh, which would contribute to, I think, the environment of, uh, of the cities, is that uh, probably the realization of form following environment is quite important. Up to now, the whole notion of uh, internal structuring, uh, maximizing or programmatic, uh, program programming the building internally is, uh, I mean, and the isolation and articulation of buildings is really uh, not that sensible. But uh, I, I believe today is very strongly in the notion of the separation of the, uh, of the internal form or the in internal program from the external form. And there's not enough, I think, and not enough understanding or not enough use, and we probably fall down on it too, that uh, there's not enough use of uh, or enough disciplined response to the, the existing environment and the nature of environment. I have uh, the, uh, the natural uh, analogy of the distinction between uh, many species uh, relying on the environment only. It's not a functional difference, it's not a uh, programmatic difference, uh, it's an environmental difference. And uh, it seems to me that in the Middle Ages, uh, because of the limitations of structure or whatever, that the environment was much more uniform. And if, it's, if one of the aspects of uh, of social responsibility has to do with uh, with uh, an environment as a whole, as compared with the appearance of one building, then uh, the whole the whole nature of the discipline of uh, of uh, bending what uh, what the what the uh, supposedly the laws of architecture are res with respect to uh, uh, consistency uh, to the notion of uh, relating to uh, the environment itself or the adjacent buildings, I think would make, make a much better uh, city and a much better environment than we have. I think probably most of us are guilty of, uh, of articulation of our problems. Uh, something else that I, I wanted to discuss with you, um, having just uh, returned uh, from Hong Kong and uh, Tokyo, uh, looking at cities like that, Tokyo, uh, being a city where they try everything at least once, 
and uh, it's a, a completely uh, chaotic kind of uh, environment. And Hong Kong, which is a, a white city, very consistent, um, which was very interesting to us. And um, in view of those kinds of experiences, it, it makes me wonder, when, when you design for an urban setting, um, how, how do you feel about um, uh, differentiating different materials, different colors, um, consistency in the city? I would, I would well, like I, to hear really, some... I think the essential point isn't consistency, it's relationship. All right, and, relationship. And, 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 and okay. something, some response of your building to some other right. building. Right. Would you would you like to uh, speak to that, Tony? I've just spoken to it. <laughs> <laughs> David. I think you can get into the whole the whole discussion of what Los Angeles is. Los Angeles, to many people, is the ultimate freedom. Everybody goes out and just does their own thing, and and the hell with everybody else. Um, and, and, and that's true of us right here on this board, and it's true of the guys that build the hamburger stands and everything else. This city's not unified form-wise. It's a total expression of everybody doing their own thing. There's no hierarchy. We haven't had a, a, a traditions of years of establishment, a years of established political power, or years of established wealth, or anything like that. Uh, it's, it's not like uh, the city of Boston with 120 universities in it, or the, the city of New York where everything's jammed together in a consistency, or, or a middle-aged city, or anything else. Everything's different here. It's an expression of freedom. Well, some people hate it, and a lot of people love it, you know, and, and uh, um, maybe one of the best ex examples I could ever give of that is the, is the big blue thing, you know. It's just, <laughs> I think it's great. And, and, and it's, there's no cohesive element. That doesn't relate to anything, you know, in the city. But, <laughs> and, and it's fabulous. Frank, or Chuck? Yeah, Tony, I also think that uh, you really can't make a hard, fast rule about what you're going to do depends to some extent on what's next to you. And uh, just because there's a junky building on both sides of you doesn't mean that you have to make a junky building because you want to blend into the environment. And uh, so the challenge is there. And, uh, you know, I've, I've got some streets that I don't like to go down. And I've responded to a client who said, look, uh, I've got this building on the site. And I want you to do one that matches it. And I did. Today, I don't, you know, if that challenge were given to me, I don't think I would. Or I'd fight it a little harder. And, uh, so it, it kind of depends on where you are and what's happening around you. Because uniformity in and of itself, I don't think, is uh, terribly exciting. I think, I think the, 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 the evaluation the architect should make, that if he had the six buildings to do, or one building to do, how much diversity would be introduced to the six? And if he, if he wouldn't introduce that diversity, I mean, if, uh, when he had the one commission, why would he introduce it when he has, uh, uh, when, well, if he wouldn't introduce it when he had the six buildings to do, why would he introduce it when he has one to do? And I, 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 I'm not arguing against uh, diversity. I'm, 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 I'm discussing some different basis for uh, supporting design decisions and, uh, and including the one of uh, relationship to other buildings. I think it's very, it's very little, it's very little done something to, to this uh, Los Angeles, since I'm a, sorry, uh, since I'm a, not a native, so maybe I, I see more consistency than, than you do, Dave. I think uh, in Los Angeles, let's say the striking thing is that there is consistency in the vegetation. If that wouldn't exist, it would be even the worst uh, chaotic condition. I think the other consistency is obviously the two by four, you know, three level uh, financially viable apartment buildings and other speculative buildings. And in that context, I think uh, to get back to the technological issue, which was raised and equally quickly dropped, uh, it's uh, like, uh, I, I don't think he's here, but uh, Voxman said, there's nothing wrong with a two by four. You know, it's a very good building system. The problem is with a nail. Now, uh, and, and uh, you know, we, we can do, uh, and he has tried, I guess, most of his life to figure out 
how to replace a nail. So there is consistency certainly on that level that all of those buildings that fall in that category or, you know, technologically in a building, uh, let's say, environment and economically, have that level of consistency. They may have uh, diversity in an applied or in a, um, let's say, advertisement or a decorative uh, way, which I would submit is not really architecture. It, it's, it's like a, 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 an eminent, uh, I won't name him, structural engineer gave a seminar at UCLA after the Alaska earthquake and he showed an hour's worth of slides and every time a building held up it was a good structure. Every time something fell off a building he said the architecture failed. Now you know I, I just I think the architecture should be more than three quarters of an inch or, or you know or, or, uh, other things that you can uh, do to get uh, visual diversity, but actually you do have a lot of consistency, you know, in, uh, conceptually, the way things are built, the way they are uh, in scale, and so on. You know, it's not that uh, chaotic as I see it in any event, as uh, perhaps uh, you didn't mean it, but the way it, uh, I understood too. you. The freeways added tremendous consistency. They are reasonably consistent, yeah. Uh, in just a few minutes, and we're going to open it up, okay? Um, David? And well, maybe you'd rather open it now. No, go ahead. Um, I wanted to make, a, uh, I'll make a real quick a, a comment that I have about technology. Uh, the way buildings go together is pretty low technology, and I think we might all uh, agree with that. There, there is high technology in the, probably the stressing of the steel frames in the, in the buildings in Southern California, pr very sophisticated engineering for, for earthquakes. There's, there is very sophisticated engineering going on in terms of uh, mechanical systems. Um, but, but the technology of how buildings go together is, is kind of the same as in my grandfather's day. You know, we still, we cover up everything and and uh, there's very few buildings in the world that are truly a, 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 a representative of a whole technology of things fitting together very well. We don't, you know, it's like I'm very interested in, in automobiles and building automobiles and airplanes and things like that. That's technology and the way things go together are very form and function oriented and, and, and you make them as light as possible to things to, as light as possible till they break and so on. But the way we put buildings together is so there's so many variables. There's so many reasons why we they're not very clear technologically, and 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 I don't I don't know how we'll ever get get past that. I think we we need to. Um, one way is for for the whole team effort. For the the designer of the mechanical system is very much a designer, just as much as the designer of the building, the designer of the structural system. And until we can all get together as a team, uh, 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 let's say that that's really an, an objective that, that we have to have. We really have to start designing buildings where where the the mechanical fellow who uses less in, energy and the fellow who uses less steel and the designer. Who, who is is confronted with a lot of his own variables until they really operate as a team, uh, uh, the buildings won't come together technologically. But uh, conceptual or intellectual framework for that uh, team effort. I would say the organization, not the architects. Assuming it's an the, architectural the, organization. The, the, the architectural organization, sure. very definitely. The, the architect uh, has to be the leader. I, I like, I mean, I'm happy to hear you say that. <laughs> yeah. um, I have to disagree. I think that um, I really get back to the point of view, at least mine, that the architect is naive about the forces that shape technology and where it is at a point. And sees technology as, as boxes that are put together, or, or it really, I believe, an excessively simplistic view. Um, a African hut represents the highest level of technology that, that, that was available to those people, used properly and used purely. And that is a technological expression. Uh, 
50 years from now, there will be a new technology which will allow new things. There will be a new balance between uh, factory production, machines, uh, social forces that call for a certain hand labor, a, an incredible tapestry of social and economic forces that determine where a society is at any one point. And I think that the architect's role is, is not necessarily to inject a, his own personal vision of what technology should be. Very few of us have a decent idea of what architecture should be. And rather to use the tools to try and, to try and perceive where a society and a technology is. Now we can be deceived and, and we can find ourselves lacking in vision. And, but I'm speaking about the large majority of architects. I think it's also the role, however, of some architects, a relative few, to do visionary type of projects whose sole purpose is to uh, explore an uncertain future. They, they have uh, no particular purpose beyond that. They're, they're to stimulate thought and discussion because technology can also stop and technology has to be guided to certain concerns. But our concern shouldn't be, I don't really care how a building goes together. I must tell you, I'm, my only concern is that it serve the people in it. And the best, uh, whatever best ways are given to me. So um, I, I just don't know enough about technology or the total factory input-output system of something like the United States of America to determine that two parts should be bolted together in Poughkeepsie and shipped to the site instead of pop welded together by 14 union laborers on a site. That's going to be determined. Probably they'll, they'll bid it out, and one will be cheaper. And gee, that's kind of a test of whether it's technologically sound or not, isn't it? Okay. Any other comments before we go to the audience? All right. We're open for questions. Can you phrase that very succinctly so I can repeat it? Uh, the question is how much research is going on in architectural offices? How much responsibility for research in the, in the large offices? Let's see if I can give a, a technical answer. The, the answer really is very little. Uh, uh, if you are to take typical corporations and you figure out what their annual budgets for R&D are, you, you get some kind of an average. And I just really don't know what that is right now. But, but uh, no, I think that's wrong. That, that like Frank said, if there's a beer, if there's a, a beer company, they have a high uh, uh, research and development. If it's TRW, they have a high research and development budget architectural offices don't match up to those percentages. Um, uh, and and I, wish I, I wish I knew exactly what that was. But uh, uh, architects will, I, I guess my statement is architects don't compare to other industrial processes in terms of pure research, unencumbered by the, the limits of the client and so on. Absolutely uh, true, according to my experience at any event. But also, in not only pure research, applied research, I think there is an equal role that uh, somebody should do, maybe large offices or uh, subsidiaries of theirs, uh, to, to test the products uh, that are you know, offered to the user and to have, have some kind of uniform and organized, let's say, accumulation of data, how these various uh, technological or other buildings perform, what elements give out and what kind of uh, problems occur after certain uh, you know, time periods, etc. Which is a very standard procedure in uh, a lot of other products, I'm, I'm led to believe. I'd like to add one quick uh, 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 thought about the research and development. All the architects are losing uh, they're in a very difficult period of time right now. Uh, 
probably all of our offices, probably all of the small offices. Uh, it's really rough out there. Uh, when you're gonna, when you're about to lay off ten people or whatever it is, and and you, uh, uh, you, you and somebody comes up and says, "Let's spend a hundred grand studying something or other," it's you know, it's not a very receptive market. I th I think that you know I I don't know how to project when we're going to get well or when we're going to stabilize, but uh, I I would hope that when that happens, the whole thought of of, of pure research should come into to architecture. I think it's probably more appropriate now as the complexities of all the systems become more more of a critical part of the buildings. Uh, again, it's easy to talk about the complexities of the mechanical systems because that's energy. Uh, uh, buildings, uh, whether it's passive or, well, actually passive and active uh, uh, systems that, that affect uh, energy. But uh, uh, because of the external influence is getting more complicated on buildings, I think architects are going to, to are going to have to spend time in research uh, and, and, and development. Uh, but boy, that's rough right now at this moment. When we had 350 people. If, if, if you were well managed, you should be able to spend a percentage of research while you're expanding as well as contracting, if, if you really were sharp. But, uh, uh, we're, we're trying our damnedest, you know. Part of the problem is what kind of research you're talking about. Um, when you're doing a multi-story office building and you've got a curtain wall, you know, and that thing may leak, you know, it's a, it's a hell of a lot of a different problem than if you're doing a one-story building and the thing leaks. And so um, our firm has been involved in testing products, like building a mock-up of a window wall and spraying it with water to see if the damn thing will leak before it gets up there. And sometimes, you know, you go through it and you say you've really got the system, and put it up, and it still leaks. But that kind of research I think you'll probably find that most of the firms will do. But if you're talking about trying to invent new products or new building systems, uh, that's the kind of a thing that's very difficult for any kind of a firm to do just on the come, unless you can get uh, a grant, uh, a National Endowment of the Arts, or something like that, To uh, if you have a specific program in mind and you want to explore it. Uh, to do it on your own steam is pretty tough. Son of a gun, I've just found out that I'm proud of my office. It's incredible, 26 years later. Um, in the somewhat halcyon days, um, between 1970 up to 1973, when we were still doing pretty well, our office uh, founded a pure research effort. Um, myself and two other people, varied, uh, spent, uh, the large majority of our time, we were not terribly successful, not because of the office, I have to say. They, they provided the money and support. Um, we found that, uh, I think as any, many of the architects here would find, that we were really geared to be practitioners uh, and to be uh, adept at research calls for a, a different attitude system. And it's difficult to make the transition from doing pragmatic, day-to-day -day problem solving, creating the issues and concerns that you have into projecting yourself into research work. But we tried. And there were a number of interesting fallouts from that. Um, the first building you saw was the, um, a hotel built in Florida. It's uh, 
uh, built solely of factory produced rooms uh, built by U.S. Steel under our guidance and design and uh, that was one, one product of that. Uh, it proved to be at this time economically un unsuccessful. There just were not enough, enough demand in the area but it was a fallout from that. There were several other projects, we failed in some but I think the interest was there. I think what we learned from it was, in my opinion, that the individual architect shouldn't do, go off and do research on their own. I think, I have a friend here this evening who has a wonderful phrase about what that is. It involves onanism and a straw wastebasket, but it's not really repeatable. But at any rate, um, I'm not going to go any further than that. But it, I think that we need to do, if research is to be done by architects, it should be done collectively. And what might be asked of the large firms is that uh, through the AIA or through something, some other organization, uh, that contribution be made to fund research projects. I think it's kind of silly for 100 man offices to take one man or two men or some percentage and stick him off in a closet and say, you know, this was done with us, say, okay, you know, let's do research now. Um, you just, you don't ask that of your family doctor. What you do is you set up, you know, a cancer research institute and you do it. And architects perhaps need to fund or work with industry or others to set up, you know, research programs and assist in the funding and, and spend some time and participate with them, but not sit off in the corner and do it themselves. Yes, Don Conway and um, we have tried to work with them. There is, there is a gap, I think, between the, uh, well, it's formative. We're still trying to figure out just what w is appropriate for an architect to, to, to research. What are the issues? Where, where, can he, uh, where his, are his attitudes useful? The question is uh, whether advo advocacy action can be a part of the big firm operation. I'm not sure it really belongs there. If you've got an outfit like CDC operating in uh, a city like Los Angeles, or any city, uh, perhaps a large firm has some commitment to that, either uh, financial support or putting personnel in there. Uh, on that basis, but uh, to uh, operate just as in an advocacy position as a as a firm, uh, I question whether that's the proper role for a firm. I think it's not a point of honesty, really. In that thing, in that too, most of the large firms depend on large clients, and I think in some cases they're going to find themselves trapped with uh, what seems to them a conflict uh, between their own self-interest and the interests of communities. Um, if you're working in downtown Los Angeles or any place, if we're working for the Fleur Corporation, uh, it's hard to get up a lot of interest in the firm to, going, to go out and advocate against building oil refineries. I don't say that we shouldn't do it. I'm saying that is really the bar to it, is that there's a built-in conflict, and I don't know how to fight it in big firms, is the one, you know, a negative aspect of them, that we are willy-nilly very often tied to large developers, we're tied to major banks, we're tied to one thing or another, and we can push and tug, but we do it usually quietly and sort of discreetly, and we think behind the scenes, it's very hard to come out and say, uh, you're doing a job for uh, Bank of America downtown and challenge their right to, to do something down there, to take a position that you feel personally may be better for the community and your office is involved in doing a big project. And I think you've got to just, you know, I think all of us would just have to face up to the fact that that's one of the goddamn things you live with. And it's, it's something I don't care for, but it's there. Can, can, I, can I, I? I really think that that question was misunderstood, certainly the way I understand it. 
it's not to go out and compete and burn down Bank of America uh, you know, buildings or, or branch offices. Uh, I think uh, the issue, which I thought was a legitimate one, and certainly to me interesting, is that you know, or most architects know, uh, that, uh, for example, there's a certain amount of school construction going on. There's a certain amount of other institutional uh, construction going on. School for the handicapped hospitals, regular schools, etc. And uh, I thought it is a legitimate point to debate if architects have the responsibility, without conflict of interest, to uh, produce a program and a physical design, let's assume, for a better school than you see around. And then, let's say, uh, merchandising, if you like to stay in that uh, vocabulary, the product, rather than wait for the developer to go and borrow bank, uh, some money from a bank and then paying the architect and saying, here's the school I want you to uh, design, and it's got to have, you know, arch ways so that, and uh, stucco and uh, a paved playground and uh, cyclone fence for security and uh, you know toilet partitions with a view so that you can see you know it's it's uh, the subservient role versus the leadership role which I think if you if you allow me to say it in one sentence which is the issue not a conflict of interest loop you know I mean I'm sure the Bank of America might be very happy you know any uh, if you come up with a fantastic uh, school that does, you know, children, accidents and rates will go down or whatever. Because our possibly firm. Possibly re uh, repeat that question. I hope most of you. <laughs> <laughs> it was really a declamation. Yeah, Charles. I don't think it was a question. Uh, it was a, a kind of a statement. Uh, our firm is involved in the site selection. I don't know where you get the idea that we have been given the commission to design the building. That's just nonsense. All we've been done, asked to do is uh, come up with some recommendations for site selection for the placement of the central library. Our report does not advocate the destruction of the existing building. We simply say, as a result of a tremendous amount of study that we didn't do, um, that the existing building is inadequate and the cost of repairing it is uh, astronomical. Uh, there are other sites that are available. We don't say that the existing building should be torn down. We don't say anything about it. That's a subject that's uh, open to the city council to decide what they want to do with that site. Um, 
with regard to schools, that's another issue. I uh, once did a group of schools for the city, uh, and um, they gave us a site plan, and they gave us a floor plan, and we <laughs> looked at the damn thing, and we said, Jesus, you know, that's, uh, that, that could really be fixed. And uh, I had a young student working in the office, and he said, let me have a shot at that thing, we. And uh, the school board didn't ask us to do it, but uh, I wanted to see what he'd come up with, and he came up with a hell of a good solution to this building, uh, giving it exactly the same function within the same square footage and the whole shot. So um, I took it down and presented it to the project architect, and he said, my God, that's great. I said, well, can we revise these plans and, and proceed with this concept? And he said, no, you can't. <laughs> he said, I'll tell you what I will do. Uh, I'll see if I can get somebody else to look at it, and maybe on the next one uh, somebody can use that. And uh, that's the last we ever heard of it. And I'm sure nobody ever saw it. But it was an interesting uh, exercise nonetheless. I pass. Yep. Uh, I think most of us have been raised in a time in which the look that your buildings had had some aesthetic appeal. Huh? We're all raised with a slick look of steel and glass to be, to be a good looking thing to us. But there's something terribly inhuman about most of your buildings. There's something terribly alienating about most of your buildings. I hate to, to, to pick the design center as an example, but at the particular time the design center was going up, I happened to be working in that area. And one of the really nice things about that area was that it was truly a Southern California environment. It was, it was an open air area. Most of the buildings were, were two-story buildings that the decorators passed between the streets, across the streets, uh, and there, was a, there were sidewalk cafes. There was kind of an open, uh, very relaxed, very Californian atmosphere. And, and next to this was going up this huge blue building which didn't reflect California materials, California weather, California living in any way whatsoever. And I I felt that it was really a terribly inappropriate kind of solution for that kind of area. And I think a lot of our architecture in Southern California is that way. It's not, it doesn't reflect our climate or our materials or our way of living. And I, I would like to ask you why it doesn't. I don't, I don't agree with your assumption. I mean, if you get to design a building like that, you may take a different attitude towards it. But I believe that it reflects California attitudes towards materials and technology very closely. I mean, what, what is California industry? What is California known for? Things like the movie industry, which is very advanced, very slick, uh, or the aerospace industry. And I don't see those aer airplanes coming out of California built in shingles or, okay. <laughs> or any other way. I believe it's very California. What California is about is high technology. California, it's more what she's talking about is the context of the area, the immediate vicinity, how yeah. that building affects, uh, you know, the, any, anybody who sees that building uses it. How does it affect those people? Sorry? How does it affect those people? It may reflect slick uh, California, <laughs> fast moving mm -hmm. systems, but uh, the immediate environment. Mm -hmm. How does it affect this? There is unquestionably a serious problem when you have to introduce a very large structure in an environment made up of very small things. Uh, and there is a whole issue that can be made about the change of scale in, a, in an environment like that. The, and there are many arguments, and it's not to me a very clear or clean cut one. There are many advantages to the introduction of Pacific Design Center there is got done already an awful lot for that whole uh, industry. The, the many of the spaces that were vacated in Robertson are being filled very fast. And the whole contract industry business has doubled in that area since Pacific Design Center. Because Pacific Design Center, it's a new scale tool. It's a new scale machine uh, that has been able to, it's able to perform functions that were not possible to perform before in the single isolated showrooms in Robertson Boulevard. The, what we had before was a, an aggregate of 
uh, contract interior services serving a local market, Southern California, what Pacific Design Center has done, and this is something that has nothing to do with the architecture. Anybody could have built it and the function would be the same. The, what the Pacific Design Center has done is to build a much larger scale machine that has created a much larger regional market that is primarily the whole Western market uh, up to Colorado or so. And, uh, and, uh, and the business has increased, is doing the job, and the people who are in the, in the whole contract interior business in the area, not everybody, of course, because you know, people are affected differently, but by and large, the industry has benefited enormously. And this is, uh, therefore, an economical improvement uh, that we all seek. And there are sometimes there are conflicts with economic change and with uh, structural or physical changes. The, I have never found that area around Melrose particularly beautiful. Uh, you know, I have, you know, and it's very, to be very easy to document those buildings that are around it. You know, it may be charming, small scale, but it's not particularly beautiful. And it's not something that is going to have a very long life. It's a, you know, we can see it is a transient it's a transient scale. Uh, and the Pacific Design Center does something else. Indeed, it may be questioned, and I will not disagree with the question of what it does in the very immediate environment across the street. Uh, in the other hand, I find I am very comfortable with what it does to the more general environment. I used to drive by that area, I still do. And that used to be a no man's land as I drove by. with. Just and it's very important that single factor that I know exactly where I am, I positive thing have those kinds of points that tell you here you are or you are that far from that place and so on. Uh, and sometimes they require to be a rather large intrusion on the normal landscape. And I think they, in, from that point of view, if it, anything, it strengthens that fabric and it doesn't diminish it. I, I used the word machine, as I said, before the architect came up into being. Uh, the machine is the function that the building performs. I could also this could describe the school we are in as a machine. You know, that was just a... It's a very nasty <laughs> remark, and I can't repeat it. You know, you talked a lot about environmental responsibility, and it, it seemed to me that environmental responsibility meant to you that it consumes less oil and it, it doesn't run its air conditioners as much. And, and, but how about the people? That's the most important element of the environment, the people that, that the building affects. Now, how can you make your building more responsible? I'll tell you, the people that work in Pacific Design Center, I'm stopped continuously, and they tell me how extraordinary it is to work there. They may try, be trying to flatter me or compliment me, but I have never been so complimented in any other building I have ever done. Actually, there are a couple of others, but, <laughs> but it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a building that I have just received more compliments about people who work there and how fantastic it is to work there than any other one. I think the people who work there are very happy with the building. Yeah? I don't know you, you directors. No, so I think, um, I think there is question. an important question, though, which I think all of us struggle with, and that's you know, the broad general question of you know, are we doing the right thing? Is, you know, uh, you always appear very confident, or one should, but uh, every once in a while at 3 o'clock in the morning you wake up and wonder, you know, if you're really screwing up the whole world with what you're doing. I felt this maybe more sharply recently, or it's, and I was very confident about what we were doing. I've uh, been working on the restoration of the state capital in Sacramento, 
which is a strange old building. The architect went mad. <laughs> One of seven, uh, at best, uh, mediocre architects. And um, been in there doing uh, Corinthian capitals and uh, Wilton carpets and uh, the total restoration. I was telling my wife, I've, I felt like a whore that's been dropped, uh, a monk that's been dropped down in a brothel and it caught halfway between embarrassment and delight. You know, I'd say, really uh, wonderful to be back. Uh, God, you know, because the thing I found I was working on was ornament and decoration. And the strange thing is, after, you know, you've seen the buildings, you know, we all do, you know, they're uh, very machined. And good Lord, that, you know, the lines will still come floating out of the hand, the strange little squiggles and uh, uh, just as good as the old guy's stuff. But the question is, um, Yes, that w we had thousands of years to develop that kind of vocabulary. We knew what we were doing. And this is true. All have gone too far. I, I think it's deplorable in a way that um, we haven't yet replaced with some new vocabulary of decoration. I like decoration. I think it's terrific on that building. Um, there's something really... I can't describe it. I like it. And it's lacking now on some of the buildings that, uh, that we're doing. The buildings we have have a boldness, a, you know, you can look at the pictures on the wall and you saw the slides. They have the big items. They don't yet have the small ones in them. Uh, and the Caesar had uh, a great red tile floor at the Pacific Design Center. It's got big color. 